Joel and Amos. And uh, give a, a preview of these, and hopefully uh, would uh, trigger curiosity. Dad gave a track to the uh, folks that did our tree out here, and the guy said he was a preacher. So Dad uh, offered him a reference Bible or suggested that, and he said, what kind is it? And the guy, Dad said, King James, and the guy said, whoa, that's full of errors. So he thinks all of them are full of errors. So can you imagine a preacher not trusting his gun? But that's the way it is. Okay, well, maybe we could help with that. Joel, and let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words, and I pray that you'd help us to uh, understand the doctrine of your words, and that we might be more and more curious to read your words and search them out for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Joel is the second... Um, one of the minor prophets in the category of 12. And uh, the churches nowadays, you'll not hear any preaching from the minor prophets. They just don't do that. And Joel chapter 2, verse 23 and 28 are two places where uh, charismatics will drown themselves, trying to make the Bible say what they want it to say. Okay, but uh, Joel, the main doctrine, remember the reason why God gave us a Bible was for doctrine. And when you understand the doctrines, that will make the Bible open up to you. Uh, If you limit yourself to instruction, I guess that's still okay. But then you'll have some very confusing passages that you're going to have to change the wording to make it fit into your mold. But when you understand doctrine, you don't have to change a thing. Okay, and it's a great blessing. Okay, the main doctrine, remember, of the Bible is the second coming of Christ. And, of course, that's what the prophets talked about. And Joel is no different. Uh, The phrase that he used to describe the second coming of Christ is called the day of the Lord. So you see it in Joel 1, verse 15. Joel preached to the southern tribes, okay, of Judah and Benjamin, about 150 years before they were destroyed. Joel chapter 1, verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That was very confusing to me growing up because Jesus said that. And then I'm thinking, that's 2,000 years ago. That's a big hand. Okay, but either it's one of two ways, the way you look at that. It's at hand, meaning... The circumstances of the world are ready or for it, or, or the writer himself has been pushed to it. Okay, so the writer, uh, Joel, would have been pushed into the future, and then he's going to write about some things that he saw, just like John, the Apostle John, was pushed into the future, and he saw the book of Revelation unfold in front of him, and then he wrote about it. So it says, the day of the Lord, and it's all uppercase for Lord, is at hand. And so what's that day like? And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So that's the beginning of it, the battle of Armageddon. Okay, that's 1 verse 15, chapter 2 verse 1. You'll see about uh, halfway through, for the day of the Lord cometh. It is nigh at hand. Again, he himself pushed into the future. Chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Verse 31, same chapter. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Okay, so we know that jumps into Revelation 6. Day of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 15. So we have it five times in three chapters. 
So Joel is writing about something that's going to take 2,800 years before it is fulfilled. Almost 2,900. And you talk about a book that's written into the future. Chapter 3, verse 14. Multitudes of multitudes in a valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And if you back up, that valley he's going to describe in verse 1 and 2. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So when the Bible says something's at hand, it can be postponed. Okay, like when Jesus was on earth, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of God at hand. That means it was ready to go. All the circumstances were lined up, but he allowed that statement to be limited by the free will of man, or at least flexible by the free will of man. Okay, and then if man's will went this way, then the day of the Lord was postponed. At another time. I'll give you a couple examples of that. Matthew. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. So God is. The Lord was not lying at all. When he said those statements. Matthew 3 2. uh, This one is John the Baptist. Saying it. But the Lord also said it. Okay. John the Baptist says. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well that was 2,000 years ago. But what was that condition done? Matthew chapter 11, verse 13. Okay, this is uh, the Lord Jesus talking. And he talks about the kingdom of heaven in verse 12. And in verse 11, the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God. Some similarities, some differences. And in verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye, Jews, will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Talking about John the Baptist. Notice that one little word, if, that was conditioned. And then he explains that a little bit further in Matthew 17, verse 11. And this begins to help us to understand the Gospels. Matthew 17, verse 11 and 12. Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. That's the New Testament way of spelling Elijah. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, John the Baptist, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listeth. Likewise also the Son of Man suffereth them, Then the disciples understood that he spake of them, unto them of John the Baptist. Okay, and so this is where the free will of man can affect the plans of God. Okay, so what is the plans of God for every person that's ever breathed? 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4, that all men will be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his perfect will. But when a man rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ, he thwarts God's efforts, and then then the Lord has to follow through with that. Okay, he told David in 1 Samuel 20. These are passages that are very uh, difficult for Calvinists. 1 Samuel 23, David was a fugitive on the run, pitcher in all the post office. Uh, He was going to try to go into this place called Keilah to kind of hold up. And he asked God, should I go into Keilah? He said, yes, go into Keilah. So he went into Keilah. And then King Saul found, uh, discovered through his uh, intelligence that he's in Keilah. So he's going to go get him. He's going to go get the whole shebang of him in Keilah. And then while David heard, oh, he's coming down. So he asked the Lord, will the men of Keilah turn me over? And he said, yes, they will. So what did David do? He took off. He left. Now the men of Keala did not turn him over. And the reason why is because David took off. So the free will of man can thwart the perfect will of God. So when Joel writes about the kingdom of heaven or the day of the Lord's at hand, it is conditioned. It's conditioned. 
Okay, now he himself was pushed into the future as he wrote about Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3. Okay, in chapter 2 of Joel, chapter 2, does anybody have a Schofield reference Bible? You got one? Okay, we'll use you for verification. I know of a, a better one if you want to get one. <laughs> okay, Joel chapter 2, there's three armies. Okay, in verse 1 through verse 11, you'll see a paragraph mark at verse 12. Now, Mr. Schofield splits it at 10 and 11. Is that correct? Does he got a break at 10 and 11? No, he don't have paragraph mark. Does he have a little heading between verse 10 and 11? There should be one at 10. I think there's one at 10, 11. Okay. You got the old school field? Okay. Chapter 2, verse 10. That's the one I was looking for. <laughs> okay. And so what that does is that shifts the army. Okay, where you have a paragraph mark, verse 11. That's why those are significant. In chapter 2, verse 1, you have an army. This is the bride of Christ. If you're saved, that's us. Superman and Spider-Man's got nothing over us. Come that time. Okay, and Cole won't have to wear a Superman outfit. He will be Superman or uh, Spider-Man or whatever he is. So you have one army. This is called the army of the Lord, verse 11. That's the bride of Christ riding the horses behind Jesus, and we will come in and mop up. Walk up and down walls, you know, like ants do. Okay, then there's another army, chapter 2, verse 18. This is called a northern army, verse 20. That will be... A coalition of forces of the United Nations, along with Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and so forth. And then there's a very small army, chapter 2, verse 25, and he calls this my great army, chapter 2:25. That's pest, canker worms, caterpillars, palmer that eats the crops. Okay, and that's that's one way God. Uh, reveals to a nation pending judgment is the pests that start eating the crops. You'll see that in chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. And so that's a sign of judgment. Now, anybody that has no anything to do with agriculture, you know, you're always dealing with pest. And then you'll have a spray to kill this pest. And then that pest will get immune to the spray, or you have another pest come up, or a fungus. you are always something. Always something. And that's a sign of judgment on the society. That's God's fair warning to us, to our nation. That's one way. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he'll start using drought, hurricanes, too much rain. Okay, if you follow anything out in California, hoping Felipe can stay above water. Okay, it's, it's, you know, bad out there. That's all signs that God is giving a natural, using natural events to give warning to a nation. Okay, in chapter 3, you have what's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. This is called the Judgment of the Nations. It's described here in jo Joel chapter 3. Verse 1, for behold, in those days and at in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So that's the restoration of Israel. What's going to happen before God restores Israel? Verse 2, he's going to get all the nations and they're going to be judged. Okay, and what, what are those people, what were they doing previous to this judgment, verse 11, 
They have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. They're selling Jewish children on the market. Pizzagate in full swing. Okay, this is the only time the word boy or girl, okay, boy or girl is found in one verse in the Bible. It might be the only time boy or girl is found. I can't remember. Okay, and so... This is described by Jesus in Matthew 25. Now, this is the one all the liberals get confused because the liberals think that everybody hits the judgment. There's a scale. If your good outweighs your bad, you go to heaven. If your bad outweighs your good, you go to hell. Okay, and they get that from Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. But this judgment of the nations has nothing to do per se with eternal life. It is the ones who pass the judgment go into the millennium. Matthew 5, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Okay, that's pretty obvious, right? Second coming. And all the holy angels with him. Then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Second coming. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep were the ones who tried to help out the righteous. The goats were the ones that took advantage of them. The sheep, as you read down through it, were able to go into the millennium, come enter into my kingdom, and the goats were thrown into hell. Okay, so this this is not anything to do per se with salvation. It deals with people who are allowed to, to go into the millennium, the ones who happen to survive the tribulation. That's called the judgment of the nations. And then the last part of Joel, this little outline here, chapter 3, verse 17, is the restoration of the nation of Israel. Chapter 3, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Maybe, yeah, you can, you can run it there, or even 18 to 21. That's where the nation of Israel is restored. The remnant gets the inheritance. Okay, and that's where he writes about that. Now, here's the two places I want to show you that the charismatics have a major confusion. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. And this is a problem when you don't understand doctrine. Okay, I'll, I'll show you how a charismatic interprets this. He says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Okay, so I don't know about, I read about rain, right? When I read about rain, I think water droplets from the from sky. Now, I don't have a charismatic mindset. Okay, here's their interpretation. The former rain is Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit of God came down. And the latter rain started in the early 1900s when Amy McPherson got the modern charismatic movement and and started, where the Spirit of God came down. Then there's a guy named William Branson that had a lot of these things, and people actually saw a little flame dance above his head while he's preaching. William Branson was, you can find him online, uh, 1950s and 60s, miracles, all this stuff. I had to to deal with one of these guys years ago down at Rensselaer. I mean, he was a flat nutcase. Okay, but that's, that's how the charismatic interprets that. The former reign is Acts 2. The latter reign is the modern charismatic movement. Okay, that's their interpretation of that. Okay, mine is a little more simple. Okay, the former rain and the latter rain that comes down in the first month is water falling from the sky at the beginning of the millennium because there's going to be a three and a half year drought and God will replenish the earth with water because that's what it says. Okay, and the reason why they jump that Acts 2 is in verse 28. This is the other passage they have a hard time with. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And you keep reading all the way down to 32. That's the context. 
If you have a cross-reference, it will take you to Acts 2, verse 17. They will assume that this was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. But in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God was not poured out on all flesh. The Spirit of God came into the body of 3,000 people as a result of believing the message that Stephen gave them. There was no wonders. There was no heavens turned to blood. There was no sun turned to darkness, moon into blood, terrible day. None of that took place in Acts 2. The only thing Peter was doing in Acts 2 is he was citing Joel 2. But he wasn't applying. This is that what was going on. Okay, and so that's the confusion a person has. Now, uh, the rain in verse 23. What if my opinion was that was something different? I have as much authority as the charismatics do. I can say the former rain and the latter rain was, you know, it could have been uh, the new invention of cars. I mean, who knows? You could just make it up. And that's what happens when people make up private interpretations. Their opinion is just as good as my opinion. Okay? And that's the problem when you start adding or subtracting to the Bible. Where do you start and stop? Okay, so that's Joel. Okay, and the next one is Amos. Amos is probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible, probably because he's a country boy. He was a, uh, he had an orchard, and he was an herdman. So he had sheep. Okay, you see that in chapter 7, verse 14. He was a southern boy. So he was a rebel, southern boy, probably had a round, faded out part in the back pocket where he put his chaw, his chew in the back in there, snuff. You know, I, I mean, that's some southern boys. Probably had a, a shotgun in the back of his chariot, you know, just like southern boys would do. And uh, he was raised in sheep, and he, and he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And, and while he was out there picking the fruit... God said to him, hey, he said, I want you to go up north, and I want you to preach to the Yankees. And he said, no way, I'm not going north in the Mason-Dixon line, not me. <laughs> and the Lord says, you'll do what I tell you to do. Okay, yeah, I will. And so then he went up north for about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and then probably headed back south. Just like a lot of Kentucky men will come up here, work in the steel mills, Retire, go back down to Kentuck. Okay, and so that's Amos. He's a country boy. He prophesied to the northern tribes, even though he was from the south. And he prophesied uh, during the reign of a guy named Uzziah, and it was about a hundred. It was about eighty years prior to Syria coming in. Now, because he was a country boy, he didn't have big flowing language. He didn't use the big $50 words. He just used straight and plain talk. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, from a man that was highly educated, said, Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And then that highly educated man, Paul, said, Though I'm rude in speech, not in knowledge. Now, when he's saying rude, he's not being you know, brash with people. He's just using common, ordinary talk. That people understand. And, and that's the way we are supposed to be. Use plain, common, ordinary talk so people can understand. And uh, he, he, he downright got really uh, pointed to some folks. Now, the city folks have a hard time with us country folks talking straight and plain. They like it to have a little veneer on it. You know, don't call him a drunk. He's an alcoholic. You know, I mean, they like to soften it down, political correctness. Okay, and Amos chapter 7, if you would look in verse 10. Amos 7 verse 10, I just like this guy. It says, then Amaziah the priest of Bethel. Okay, Bethel, that, that means Beth, house, El, God, house of God. So this is a priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Now, Jeroboam was a bad guy. He had a golden calf. 
He made his own. He had his own church situation or temple situation or synagogue. So what are they accusing Amos of? Verse ten: Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. Okay, now this guy didn't understand what a conspiracy was. A conspiracy has to be two or more people. How can one guy conspire? It has to be two or more. So he's blaming Amos. And he says, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words. When a society can't deal with words, you're just speaking words, you know, free speech. You're dealing with a society that's falling apart. I mean, come on, you can't handle words? Okay, but that's where our culture is becoming. And then he says, for thus Amos saith. Okay, now Amos, he said, this is what Amos said. Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer. Now when he uses the word seer, that's, that's a sarcastic slam, because the word seer was an archaic word, and the word prophet was used in those days. So he was like, it's like somebody slamming us about the King James. Oh, these in the house. So that's what he's doing. He's, kind of, he's mocking Amos. O thou seer, go flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. He said, go someplace else and preach. Go back home. Down, go back south. And Amos, if Amos was, you know, if he'd called him at the right time, he said, you must be speaking of the Lord. I'm out of here. You Yankees could go to hell. I don't care about you. <laughs> he probably would have gladly said that. Okay, but then he says this, But prophesy not again at, anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, it's the king's court. Okay, so government intruded into the, the church structure, the synagogue. Then answered Amos, said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was a prophet's son. I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. So in the Old Testament, man, remember, God can pick a guy up and move him. The Lord took me as I followed a flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. So that's what I'm doing. Then he says this, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord. Now, this is going to be a real uplifting message. The guy's going to walk away greatly encouraged. He's going to say, oh, I feel so much better about myself after you spoke the words of the Lord to me because it's so nice. So here's what he said. Thy wife shall be in harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. And then he said, have a good day. See you later. <laughs> okay. And so that's the country boy. He just straight up right to him. And I'm sure that Amaziah was just sitting there stewing and mad and trying and wanting to kill him. Okay. But why did Israel fall? Why did Israel go down? Amos told them several times. Chapter 2, verse 4. So Amos is telling them straight up, here is why Israel's going down. 2, verse 4, Thus said the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies caused them to err after that, after the which their fathers have walked. You're ignoring the Bible. In chapter 4, verse 4, he uses sarcasm. Now that's often a gripe against some of us Bible believers using sarcasm. God is instructing Amos to be sarcastic. Sarcastic is a biting humor. Chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Come to Bethel. Well, that's good. Come to church. Come to Bethel. Come to the temple. 
and transgress. Now, that's weird. Go to church so you can sin. He says, At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Under Leviticus, it's supposed to be without. He says, Go ahead and bring it with leaven and proclaim and publish the free will offerings for this liketh you. He's telling them, go to the temple, bring your sinfulness, bring all your wickedness, because that's what you're going to do anyway. For this liketh you, O children of Israel, saith the Lord. And so what do they do? Well, down in the local synagogue or Bethel, they've got in the corner, they've got their drums with a great big glass thing around it because they don't want anybody messing with it. And they've got their guitars and they've got their music and they've got about six or seven mic stands up here. And they've got the screen down and they've got the bouncing ball on the screen. And they're sitting there singing praise songs to the Lord. And Amos says chapter 5, verse 21... I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offering, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vows. You make me sick. That's Amos. Nothing's new under the sun, is there? Chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. There's a fellow in um, Montana, Nathan Bemis is his name. Some of you have heard that name. Ruckman used to talk about how dumb Nathan Bemis was. He spelled Bible, B-I-B-U-L. But uh, Nathan loves the Lord. I've been to his church once. And he was preaching someplace in Colorado, and Dr. Lee Roberson happened to be in the meeting. Now, Dr. Lee Roberson, if you know about him, Tennessee Temple, Highland Park, that guy heard thousands of messages. But Nathan Bemis preached on Amos 8, verse 11. And of the thousands of messages that Dr. Lee Roberson, years have gone by, and, he, and somehow he came across Nathan Bemis. He said, I remember what you preached. And it was about hearing the words of the Lord and a famine. And unfortunately, Dr. Lee Roberson fired a guy because he believed in the King James Bible. This guy was a gracious guy from the testimony that I'd heard. And he actually told the guy, he said, I'm sorry, I can't have you here because I got Greek professors that don't believe like you do. Well, fire the Greek professors. Okay, but isn't it amazing how that one message stuck of the thousands that that man has heard? Because he's preached all over the place. And the problem was the word of God. Tennessee Temple is no longer. They've changed names. It's gone contemporary. And it's a big joke in these days. I don't even know what they call it nowadays. So when a nation starts doing that, the Lord is going to use natural warnings, catastrophes, and then he's going to use national warnings. Okay, what's a sign to a nation that God's judging it? Well, Amos points them out, chapter 2, verse 3. He says, I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof and will slay the princes thereof with them, saith the Lord. So the judges are going to be bad. The politicians are going to be bad. Chapter 2, verse uh, 6. Notice what these judges will do. Uh, he says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Okay, so that's what the politicians are doing to the people. Chapter 5, verse 12. He said this, verse 10. 
They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. That's a political place. They abhor him that speaketh uprightly. And then verse 12, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside the poor in the gate from the right. So you and I have no rights. Okay? And whenever a person relies upon government for their rights, they're going to lose them. So that, that's a national thing. You can see that. I can run other places on that one. What is Amos' uh, suggestion for the best preparation when judgment's on the docket from God? Chapter 4, verse 12. Best preparation. Thus will, will I do unto you, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. How do you prepare to do that? Chapter 5, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. But seek not Bethel. Now, look at there. There's a verse that you don't want to go to certain churches. Seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal. Gilgal. Pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek ye the Lord, and ye shall live. Verse 8, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, the one who created the stars. Seek him. And that's the best, that's the best preparation for the judgment of God. And then the last chapter, Amos chapter 10, he closes out with, you and I can guess it, the second coming of Christ. Chapter 9, verse 1 through 10 is the tribulation time period. Okay, and then the ending, uh, 11 through 15, around that range, is going into the millennial time period. So that's how he closed out his book, with that great, exciting news. The Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. Okay, we'll stop there. Lord, I do ask you to help us to... Uh, be excited about what these prophets preach. And I'm sure old Joel's heard many a time, oh, yeah, we've heard that before. Yeah, 2,800 years still hasn't uh, come true. But it's going to. And, Lord, I pray you'd help us to be faithful to your words. In Jesus' name, amen.